Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our next episode of Rewalks Topics and Neuro Rehabilitation webcast. I'm Jill Butler, and today we'll be talking with Dr. Rebecca Martin. Rebecca is the Manager of Clinical Education and Training at the International Center for Spinal Cord Injury at Kennedy Krieger Institute an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. She received her Bachelor's of Science from Boston University in 2001 and her Occupational Therapy Doctorate from Rocky Mountain University in 2008. Rebecca also speaks nationally on topics related to activity-based rehabilitation, and she has taught many continuing education courses in the areas of neurological, pathology, rehabilitation, and research. Her current research is in novel applications of electrical stimulation to restore functions lost to spinal cord injury. Her talk today will highlight some of the challenges that clinicians face in achieving high volumes of repetitions in activity-based rehab following neurological injury and introduces some techniques for combining modalities like NMES or movement biofeedback in order to facilitate mass practice of targeted activities to increase repetitions and drive neuroplastic recovery. Hi, Rebecca. It's so great to talk with you today. Thanks so much for having me. Um, Rebecca, so I'm really looking forward to this talk today because mass practice and high volumes of activity-based therapy are super important for achieving the repetitions needed for neuro rehabilitation. But with only a limited time with each patient, sometimes this can be difficult to achieve. So to our viewers, we'd love to hear from you as well. Whether you're a PT and OT, what are some of the techniques that you use to maximize repetitions or intensity in your clinical practice? We'd love to hear your thoughts. And don't also forget to like and subscribe to this video if you want to hear more talks like this one. So with that, Rebecca, I'm going to let you take it over from here. Thanks. Thanks to Jill and the team for having me today. Um, I'm super excited to talk about this topic. Increasing volume of activity and rehabilitation is near and dear to my heart. Um, I often walk through my gym and say, can you do one more? How can we get this closer to normal? How can we get a little more volume in? Um, and that's because it is activity that is what creates change in the nervous system. And as you talked about, this sort of neuroplastic capacity of the nervous system is really engaged with activity. And so it's super important. We have this really big responsibility as therapists to make sure that we're providing patients enough activity to make change. So I'm gonna talk about spinal cord injury, but all of this could be true for brain injury or stroke or CP. Um, basically that we know natural recovery is complicated and limited. So in the spinal cord itself, there are a number of problems. First is that initial cell loss, that cavitation fills in with fluid over time and forms a cyst. There's a scar that surrounds the cyst that represents a mechanical barrier to recovery, but also releases inhibitory cytochemicals, which tell the nervous system, this is a zone of damage and you should not come here. There are axons that are transected and axons that are demyelinated in both cases representing a conduction block. So it's a really complicated problem. And up till now, scientists have been working on a few strategies to make that better. So the first is administration of exogenous cells. So this is where we're putting cells from outside into the spinal cord. Um, these might be a person's own cells, sort of um, adipose derived or mesenchymal stem cells. They might be stem cells from a different source. They might be enzymes to help break down the scar or take up some of the fluid in the cyst. Um, they might be growth factors or progenitor cells that are differentiated in a dish. There's also scientists working on building scaffolding. So this is generally biosynthetic materials, sometimes 3D printed, sometimes impregnated with some of those enzymes to help direct, direct axonal regrowth and remyelination. The thing that we can do is help to supercharge those remaining connections. We know that in nearly all cases, there is some amount of preserved tissue. Even in patients who appear clinically complete, it is likely that there are axons spanning the zone of damage that are capable of carrying message, but aren't doing that efficiently. So with activity, we're able to supercharge those remaining connections and unmask latent voluntary function. So let's talk for a second about activity-based therapy. Here's a pop quiz. Um, Lang, Catherine Lang at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis did a study in 2009 where she evaluated 310, 312 therapy sessions in post-stroke rehab. So in their 60 minute sessions, how long do you think the patient actually gets therapy? 
you have your guesses. <laughs> Was it 36? Because that's how many minutes people are actually engaged in tasks. And if the goal of the session was upper extremity functional movements, patients were only doing about 32 repetitions. That's less than one a minute. And in a 60 minute session, it's like one every two minutes. Worst news for my PT friends, that if the goal of the, lower, of the session was lower extremity functional movement, they were only doing six repetitions and 357 steps in a gait training session and only 11 transfers, if that was the goal of the session. So you can imagine how little that really is. Now look, I've worked in an acute rehab, I get it. The patient needs to put their pants on, the patient feels nauseous, the patient needs a break, the patient needs their meds, the doctor comes around, I get it. There are barriers to meeting that 60 minutes, um, but I still think we could do better. And so does Catherine, she says it's not enough. The amount of practice compared to animal doses and animal muscle, animal models is very small and it's not enough to create change in the nervous system. And you add to that the fact that people with physical, chronic physical conditions are at a greater risk of inactivity than able-bodied persons because they are restricted from normal everyday activities like walking and housekeeping. I was talking with a colleague just yesterday about a study that has come out of the UK and in the pandemic, people, normal, healthy people went from about 150 minutes of activity a week down to less than 20% of that, to about half an hour of activity. And this has immediate significant consequences on our overall health, metabolic status, um, abdominal fat, but then also long-term consequences for our muscle composition, our bone health, um, and our neurological system. So activity-based therapy, we focus on providing repeated near normal activity, both above and below the level of the lesion to first optimize the nervous system for recovery and second, offset the rapid aging and physical deterioration associated with spinal cord injury. We're providing high intensity practice of both task specific and pattern activity above and below the level of the lesion to restore neurological function and promote neural recovery. It's no longer enough to give a 19 year old boy a bag full of equipment and say, here's what you have to, to use to go out to dinner with your friends. He's not, I've done that dozens of times in my life. And every time they come back and say, I never touched it, right? Our goal now is to help patients really restore function. They've lost a spinal cord injury, get closer to normal because they're more likely to use that. So there's generally five key components of activity-based therapy, functional electrical stimulation, locomotor training, weight-bearing, mast practice, and task-specific practice. I wanna give you a little bit more evidence because you're probably thinking, hmm, I don't know, I don't know about this. Um, so in terms of evidence and dose for intensity and effectiveness, we published a study in 2012 where we looked at a stimulated grasp and release um, intervention. We had three subjects with chronic cervical spinal cord injury who got 30 minutes of stimulated grasp and release over two weeks. And here's what that looked like. So when we push the button down, his hand opens, and when we let the button go, his hand closes. And so he has his own shoulder and elbow function, but doesn't have any voluntary hand function. And so by stimulating him to open and close, he was picking up and dropping those balls into the container. In our 30 minutes of repeating this cycle, he was doing on average, or they all did on average, 210 repetitions within that 30 minutes. So if you start to think back to that, 36 minutes of intervention and 32 repetitions. Now I've got 212 repetitions in 30 minutes. Of course, this was a specific focused intervention, but we did see improvements in grasp, strength, speed, and prehension quality in just two weeks. The improvements were immediate and were seen 24 hours after the last in intervention, suggesting that there is a carryover effect. Patients reported that they were able to use their hands more efficiently in their daily activities. So he, patients were reporting that they would go out and they would um, pick up drinks and that they could engage in hair brushing and toothbrushing and things like that where they hadn't been doing them for themselves before. 
So now you're probably thinking, all right, I get it, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> okay, I hear you. And Catherine Lang's group did a follow-up study in 2014 to look at, do there, is there really time for that? So in this case, they looked at 15 patients with upper extremity paralysis post-stroke in inpatient rehab facility. Each of them got four days a week of individually tailored upper extremity training where they were aiming for at least 300 repetitions in 60 minutes, and then two days a week of ADL training. And the headline here is that mass practice did not inhibit skill acquisition. So they found they were able to do 47 minutes, better than our 36, but this real significant jump was in repetitions, 289 repetitions per session. You might be worried about your little old ladies complaining about shoulder pain, but it didn't happen. Fatigue was an issue, but you should feel fatigue when you are exercising and challenging the nervous system. That's how you know you're making change. Also, sessions were not often missed, right? So I have worked in acute rehab and half your time is spent convincing Mrs. Jones to get out of bed for therapy. Here, because patients felt so much more engaged, they did not want to skip therapy. They were much more likely to participate. Improvements in the action research arm testing, grip and pinch strength, right? So those are component level skills were equal across, or sorry, were higher in the training group than they were in the usual care group. And FIM scores, that's a functional measure, were equal across the two groups. So patients got better at component level skills and at least as good in their ADL training. So now you're thinking, okay, maybe I got a little time for that. And so here's what we need to know in terms of mass practice. It is high volume repetition of the task components. Obviously you're not gonna ask somebody to brush their teeth 12 times in your session, but you might do a whole bunch of grasp and release and then go to the toothbrushing activity. We focus on high volume repetition with near normal kinematics, right? This is how we avoid pain and overuse syndromes is by making sure that patients are moving appropriately through their patterns. And then we, pro we provide them with support through modalities. So we use electrical stimulation to increase neural excitation and help with lacking muscle strength and reinforce that pattern through biofeedback. So here's another example of a stimulated activity. So the stimulation comes on, his fingers flex, the next channel comes on and his thumb adducts. And so now he's using again, his own shoulder and elbow motion in combination with that lateral pinch. Um, this is one of my favorites, right? This is one of the great things about therapists is how creative they can be. Um, and so this therapist suspended a ping pong ball from the ceiling, put a patient in a mobile arm support, the SABO mobile arm support, and then used stimulation to her tricep to help with that extension activity. And you can see she's just able to do this over and over and over and over. And so it's really focusing on that elbow extension. Meanwhile, the therapist is giving her clue, cues about her trunk balance, her posture. She's being challenged in terms of her attention. She's being challenged in terms of her balance. We could add additional challenge to her balance by having her in a unilateral stance or a tandem stance. Um, you could switch arms. You could have both arms suspended and be doing a reciprocal patterning. There's sort of endless numbers of options. Here's another device that provides us with EMG triggered motor assist at the elbow. And in this case, also for the pinch. So this patient is using the device to pick up the cones and stack them. So he's again, working on target. He's getting some isometric work at his shoulder by having to hold and his movement is being reinforced through this biofeedback patterning. So there's sort of really endless numbers of ways you can combine these things. It's about thinking through what our goals are for our patients and how do you challenge them a little bit more? How do you get closer to normal? How do you do one more repetition? So this is, you know, often researchers will put up pictures of their lab and they'll show their postdocs and everything. I don't have postdocs and I don't have a lab, but I have a gym full of people who really care and who are really motivated and pushing. And so here are my patients and their families and their friends getting ready to run a marathon. And, um, 
And so I have this responsibility to do better for them because this is real life, right? That was really great. Thank you for such a great overview and some giving us some specific examples also of ways that clinicians can help put this evidence into practice. You introduced a lot of great concepts and techniques that I'm sure our visit, our viewers will want to learn more about. So I'm going to ask a few follow-up questions for them. So one of the limitations on patients and therapist time often is the perceived need to focus on retraining specific ADLs. However, you here presented research which demonstrated that a higher ratio of targeted mass practice versus ADL training did not sacrifice performance in the ADLs. Can you talk a bit more about how therapists can promote carryover from the mass practice to drive the improved performance of the ADL tasks? Yes, that's a great question. So I did show you some data where patients who were engaged in that upper extremity training followed by ADL training had good functional skills outcomes. So for us, it often we often combine the two in a, in a singular session. So we'll help patients to identify, or in our evaluations, we'll identify the component level skills that are weak, then we'll address those, often in combination with NMES, with um, some supportive devices, with biofeedback, where we're addressing this one component skill. So maybe somebody's goal is an upper body dressing, let's say. And so you get somebody sitting on the edge of their bed, you apply stimulation or you use the overhead lift system to help with unweighting of the arm and you do some activity that involves just that shoulder flexion, just that, that skill that they're missing to help them to complete the upper body dressing. So for kids, maybe it's, it's hitting a balloon back and forth um, for, or maybe it's painting on a, on a, like the bigger the mess, the better, right? So maybe it's like finger painting, or in some cases, I've even had somebody face the other way in their bed and we put shaving cream all over the windows. Um, you'd be surprised how many adults can get into that too, just as a way to sort of engage and, and do those repetitious activities. And then you do that, you use that, you've primed the nervous system, you've reinforced the motor pattern, and then you use that to do the functional skill. So now we're using that same shoulder flexion to complete the upper body dressing task. And then you just work through the components. What's the thing that's really limiting the person from achieving this task independently? And that's where you start. Awesome. That was a really well thought out and a very specific answer. That was really great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you sort of already touched on some of this, I feel like in that first answer that you gave us, but. I'm interested more specifically in the movement biofeedback system, something like maybe the MediTouch is something that I'm becoming more familiar with. And I think that your facility does have. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering more specifically about the, with movement biofeedback, how do you recommend um, specifically using that to engage the patients, um, both with the ADL stuff and with the mass practice? Yeah, so biofeedback is a great tool um, to help patients with neurological salt for a few reasons. One is that sometimes the motion is just barely emerging. So maybe we can help it, but it's not enough to move against gravity. Or maybe it's enough to um, initiate, but not complete the task. And then the second thing that's great about biofeedback, particularly for neurological patients, is that it helps patients to tease out when there's co-contractions, which is super common, particularly in upper motor neuron presentations like stroke and spinal cord injury, where there's a lot of spasticity. It can be hard for somebody to initiate a movement in one direction without getting all of these additional things. The harder they try, the more their arm starts to jump or their trunk goes into extension, right? So but feedback is a great source for that um, to help tease out those things. We can provide somebody with feedback that says you've accomplished the task. We can pair it with stimulation to help them complete the task. Um, and then we can help to get closer to normal in those repetitions by providing that, by using that biofeedback. The MediTouch in particular is a great option because um, even if the patient's only able to move a little bit, it's reflected back to them as full range across the screen in whatever activity it is that they're engaged in. The other thing that's really great about the Moody Touch is that it inherently demands these high volume of repetitions, right? All of the activities are structured to be repeatable over and over with consistent targets. And then you can increase those targets over time to help the patients to move a little bit further. 
Yeah, absolutely. Those are the things you touched on are some of the main things that I do like about biofeedback in general and the MediTouch. And then the piece that you said too about working on getting away from that co-contraction type um, scenario that sometimes patients sort of get locked into. Um, that's something that I'd like to learn more about, I think. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else you have to sort of add to that specific piece. Um, but I think that that is something that there's a huge need for, for help with. And I'm I'm hopeful that the whole gaming piece, plus, like you said, the magnifying bit, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, incorporating the biofeedback to help with getting people out of those co-contraction type situations. Yeah, I think one of the things I love about biofeedback is that there's often patients will try to push really hard, right, because they want to show you that they can do it or that they can move, whatever. And when they do that, they wind up recruiting all this other stuff, right? They're not they're not able to sufficiently engage the thing that's weak, let's say your bicep. And so you get this overflow into all of these other things, shoulder, tricep, trunk, and you get this overflow. So the biofeedback, I love because you can put it on, you can set that threshold real low for them. And so as soon as they engage their bicep, they get the reward, the thing moves, the game accomplishes, right. they shoot the basket, they explode the asteroid, whatever it is, MediTouch has some great options. Um, and then they're, you, you give them that reinforcement before they start to, to engage everything else. And so that makes sense. They get this real low level. And then as they get stronger, they start to engage, they'll be able to engage more. Right. Right. So like stopping it before it's even engaged in sort of engaged is the idea rather yeah. than sort of a negative response for once it's already happening. Right. So using the positive feedback side of it. I like that. That's really great. My other favorite thing to do with biofeedback is to put somebody in a weight bearing position. Sometimes that closed chain positioning um, provides proprioceptive feedback that then augments their motion and then they're able to tease out those responses a little bit better even. Yeah, just like, yeah, a little bit more natural for them. Mm -hmm. All right, that's awesome. So one more question, lastly, uh, what are some resources that you might recommend for any of our viewers who are interested in learning more about some of the research that you discussed today or any of the techniques and modalities that you presented about? Um, that's a great question. So my favorite um, articles and um, textbooks are all included um, in some of our training materials, which you can find at um, spinalcordrecovery.org. You can also, I have given longer lectures and more in-depth discussions of NMES, spinal cord injury, and activity-based rehab on occupationaltherapy.com. You can subscribe and watch those. Um, and then there's lots of research coming out of really great places like um, Kennedy, but also Shepard and Craig on electrical stimulation and biofeedback um, and movement retraining. And so all of those are great resources too. Awesome. And we'll have all those included down below in the notes for this episode for all of our viewers to find there. Um, so thank you so much for a great talk, Rebecca, and thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And to our viewers, we hope that you've been finding these talks informative. Don't forget to reach out in the comments section with some of the modalities and techniques that you guys use in your clinical practice to help drive repetition and intensity. Please also make sure to like and subscribe to the video using the buttons below and feel free also to use the comment section to suggest future talks or speakers that you'd like to see. We hope that you guys tune in again with us next time. Take care, everyone.